Creepy, dude. Creepy. Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Blaze. This one is terrible Kickstarter projects that, have sh that should never have existed. My opinion of Kickstarter is kind of like, well, none of the projects should exist because they all end up being just a little bit right. What happens here is uh, Danny, he writes me a script. I will read it. Sam afterwards will add some fine vintage memes. And uh, well, that's what we do here, people. And there's occasionally a little bit of this. Let's get into it. I hear a lot of mixed opinions about Kickstarter. Oh, uh, I do as well. And I hear a lot of love for Kickstarter. I've backed a few Kickstarter projects and they've all just turned out to be a little bit shit. And I kind of think of Kickstarter as like, yeah, if you've got a good idea, but you're just not confident enough to put your own money in it or ask your friends or family, or you know, you don't have a solid enough business plan to approach a bank. So you ask a bunch of strangers for some money. You make a product that takes way longer than you're gonna say for way more money than you're gonna say. And then eventually you deliver it to the people who have bought it like a year later, at which point it's way less exciting. Anyone remember the Pebble watch? It was like a watch with an LCD dis display on it. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. There's a watches of an LCD displays forever. I mean, we've all had that little Casio. We've all seen that little Casio one forever. But like, I don't know, Pebble, it was like a watch with, I don't know, stuff on it. Like a, it was like an original smartwatch or something. Um, And everyone was very excited about this. But I swear by the time it was actually shipping, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now there's like the Apple watch, isn't there? <laughs> it's just objectively much better in every way. How innovative! I like it! Oh god, we're one line in and we've already been ranting. Let's carry on. Over the years, I've pledged to several projects that interested me, and they all turned out mighty fine and dandy. And I've often thought it's a brilliant way to test demand and raise funds directly from your target audience without having to get any greedy sharks or dragons sticking their greasy thumbs into the creative juices of your pudding. Well, yeah. I guess, but it's also like the people, those greedy people are also experts at business and will have an idea whether your product's gonna be successful or, uh, or a piece of shit. I've got a writer friend who thinks Kickstarter is the best thing since cheese footballs. Danny, the cheese footballs are not good. Whenever he's planning a new book, he launches a campaign on Kickstarter before he's even written the first word. If his campaign hits the funding goal, he's already pre-sold enough copies to make writing the book a worthwhile endeavor. I'm gonna... <laughs> It's amazing that this exists. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna write a book about um, sexual predator clowns. And uh, if I raise my funding goal of $10,000 on Kickstarter, you'll have the book about sexual predating clowns. What are we doing? This is the worst idea ever. If not, he'll scrap the whole idea and move on to something else without wasting a year of his life writing about goblins that nobody wanted to buy. All right, I mean, oh God, I don't know. Am I changing my opinion as we go? Because this actually doesn't sound like a bad idea. Because I don't want to spend a year of my ri life writing about sexual predator clowns without, you know, knowledge that everyone's going to buy it. But of course, I've also heard stories of people who pledged good money on relatively simple projects in which all the investment cash got pissed away on cocktails and kebabs and customers were left waiting three years for a woeful product that fell far short of the original promise. I like to think that crowdfunding platforms have the potential to be an online melting pot of bold, new ideas, a crucible of creativity that cuts out the gray suits in the middle and directly connects the architect with the customer. But I suppose the flip side of the coin is that there's no quality control on the projects that get listed, just so long as you're not trying to flog drugs, porn, weapons, live animals, alleged medical treatments, or Simon Whistler decal stickers. Yeah, I would sue the shit out of you. You can really f publish a fundraising campaign for just about any old tat with no judgment. Oh, don't say there's no judgment. I am very happy to judge. And that means you're obviously going to get more than a few bad turnips in the business stew. One of the most infamous Kickstarter projects of all time started off as just a bit of a satirical joke between friends. It was a book about sexual clown predators. What? No, I'm just kidding. The implausibly named Zach Danger Brown, is this going to be the uh, potato salad one? This was from ages ago. From Columbus, Ohio, posted a project in 2014 in which he announced he was just seeking $10 to make a potato salad. The project description was the exact opposite of a Business Blaze introduction, in that it got very quickly to the point. It, be it read, basically, I'm just making a potato salad. I haven't decided what kind yet. Such 
modest ambitions quickly grew in scale, as the project surprisingly went viral, helped in part by media attention during slow news days over the Independence Day weekend. As thousands of dollars worth of pledges started rolling in, Jack Zach felt obliged to make a series of increasingly wacky stretch goals, including Zach putting better mayonnaise in the recipe, the opportunity to choose the pot a potato salad appropriate ingredients, get your own potato salad themed haikus composed in the donor's honor, get your name carved into a potato that will be used in the salad. I enjoy this. It's such brilliant satire of such a, a, a you know, the. A, of everything that's wrong with Kickstarter. The funding for the project eventually closed at $55,492. Jesus Christ, what am I doing with my life? Which, bearing in mind the original $10 goal, makes it one of the best performing crowdfunding projects in history. Kickstarter themselves seemed pretty pleased with the outcome, as they claimed to help introduce a stack of new members to the platform. They were also pleased with the outcome, because I'm sure they get a cut of this shit. Right? Meanwhile, Zach ended up spending some of the money on a free Potato Stock 2014 festival in Columbus while donating the rest to a civic foundation working to end hunger and homelessness in Ohio. That's nice of him, but I bet there was some pressure. <laughs> At first he was like, sweet, I could really use that money to like pay off my debt. And everyone was like, you gotta donate it to charity. And I was like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> charity. Those assholes. So, as silly as it all sounded, it ended up developing into quite a successful and beneficent campaign. Bene bene beneficent? Is that how you say that word? Don't care. I just don't care. For everyone involved. Sadly, you can't really say that of any of this lot. Oh my god, was this just the intro, Danny? It's like two pages long, son. Number one. There aren't numbers on here, so I'm not gonna say number one because I will lose track. The Laser Razor. They're gonna be able to shave with lasers? I mean, that sounds dangerous, but also exciting. Zoop my nose! Uh, like many other people I know, including my great aunt Ethel, I spent a big chunk of this year growing a big, bushy lockdown beard. Weird, I don't know anyone who did that. The growing trend seems to be rooted in the idea that it doesn't matter how ridiculous you might look, because you're only ever going to see the postman anyway, and he's not really bothered. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I mean, in growing my beard, no one ever sees me, so it's just the postman and my wife, and, uh, and, the, and the millions of people on the internet. My own lockdown growth developed into a surprise sprouting of many colors. It was kind of like a visual journey through the, vi the seasons via the medium of beard. People are often, people, I think people think I'm older than I, than I actually am because they think I have gray in my beard, but I don't have gray in my beard actually. It's just little blonde hairs because for some reason I'm like, my beard is a little bit half and half. Although it shows up less in the video I'm realizing. If it, it looks a bit weird, especially in the summer. Anyway, well, I don't know why I'm talking about my glorious beard, but I suppose I should think about shaving it off now. So maybe it's time to invest in a Scarp Laser Razor. It's a great name though, apart from the Scarp part. The concept of shaving hasn't really moved on so much since the last 5,000 years, but the California-based company, Scarp Technologies, looked set to change all that in 2015. And now, I mean, Dollar Shave Club, you're not a sponsor of this episode. You're not a sponsor of business plays, but uh, eh? Eh? But California-based company Scarp Technologies looked to change all that in 2015. This was news to me, but apparently human hair contains uh, a chromophore. What the f*** is that? Which can absorb certain wavelengths of light, okay? The idea behind the laser razor was that it would shoot a laser beam at your stubbly face, which would target these chromophores and zap away all of your follicles in seconds. That sounds terrifying. What are we doing? It also doesn't sound like it's real. Uh, I've never heard of a chromophore. Uh, the waterproof device would be powered by a AAA battery and would ensure that you shave off precious minutes from your morning bathroom routine while never having to stock up on replacement blades ever again. If this actually worked, it's pretty cool. It all sounds pretty cool. Danny and I. We're a couple of misfits. Same page. Uh, and plenty of hairy people agreed with me. The original funding goal was $120,000. Yet within the space of just three weeks, Scarp had managed to attract a staggering $4 million. What am I doing with my life? I just gotta make some fake product. $4 million? I'll just be like, yeah, 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 uh, uh, we couldn't deliver the project. And uh, I'm moving to the Bahamas with your four million dollars. And I I'm definitely getting a new identity. <laughs> but I've got four million dollars. I'm sure that can get me a really good, it probably can get me a better identity than I have now. Get me like Michael from Vsauce's identity. But others were a bit more skeptical. Although the technology, oh, and uh, you know, speaking of protecting your identity information online, be a good place for a Surfshark sponsorship, eh Surfshark? You wanna pick up a few more spots? You know what to do, email me. But others were a bit more skeptical. Although the technology was considered feasible to a degree, Scott, that's like saying Theranos was feasible to a degree because we can taste, test blood for diseases. They just couldn't. Oh, and the, <laughs> I made a joke previously about acquiring the Theranos trademark. 
And apparently it is going defunct, so it is available to purchase and there's like an application process. I have no idea of the legal implications of this. Like, I don't want to... It seems you can just fill out this form and it's like 250 bucks. And if it if the trademark lapses, it goes to you or something. But I'm also like, I'm not really a lawyer, especially not a US patent lawyer. And I don't want to be like on the hook for like Theranos' crimes. I'm sure I'm, I wouldn't be. But if anyone is a lawyer watching this and understands this stuff and you want to help me acquire the Theranos trademark so we can do Theranos merch, so we can uh, call this channel Business Blaze by Theranos, email me. Uh, I would like your help. Uh, I won't pay you, so bear that in mind. Oh, I would maybe send you some free merch. But others were a bit more skeptical. Although the technology was considered feasible, SCARP were very skimpy on actual details, and some critics suggested the product had never hoped to be anywhere near as effective as a simple old-fashioned razor. Yeah, I mean, the razor's pretty good. I mean, it does a good job. I, uh, shaved my shiny head this morning. SCARP always claimed to have a working prototype, but the dudes at Kickstarter began to grow doubts over this, and eventually decided to suspend the project until SCARP could provide proof of a working model in accordance with the platform's rules. Dude, they got up to four million dollars before you did this Kickstarter? Get your shit together. Allegedly. This was quite a noble thing for Kickstarter to do as it meant they were throwing away their five percent share of the funds collected so far, which would have been about two hundred thousand dollars. It's not a noble thing for them to do because if this did turn out to be a scam and Kickstarter turns a blind eye to it, how do you think that's gonna look for Kickstarter? Kickstarter definitely thought, you know, what we're up the 200,000 because, you know, if we push this fake product and people find out, you know, it's not gonna look good for us. <laughs> the FTC are gonna come a calling. Further investigation revealed that Scarp's so called prototype didn't really live up to the promise at all, as it was a flimsy and fragile product which was only actually capable of cutting one hair at a time. Wait, cutting? I thought it was gonna zap, zap your follicles with some turbo laser or something. So it probably would have added at least another six hours to your bathroom routine, but a bum bum tss. But at least you were still saving money on those rubbish razor blades. Yeah, I mean, I could pluck out all of my beard hairs by by hand, and that would save me money on razor blades, but it would also destroy my face, and uh, I don't have time for that. Although the Kickstarter project was terminated and all the pledgers got their money back, the project was moved over to Indiegogo within just hours of the cancellation, and so far it's managed to raise another $500,000. Indiegogo. That the, uh, it's like Kickstarter are bad, Indiegogo are like where you go where Kickstarter don't accept you. However, nearly five years on, there's still no sign of the laser razor, and all you get to see on the Indiegogo page are very sporadic updates which largely just apologize for the lack of proper updates. The much delayed laser razor is currently promised for 2021, but I'll eat my weight in sheep wool if that turns out to be true. Okay, Danny, Jesus. Daddy, chill. Maybe there were clear warning signs from the beginning. Most of the photographs of Scarps founders and engineers to displayed on the original Kickstarter shape page showed a bunch of men with big shaggy beards. Their hearts obviously were never in it. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen, does it? I mean, prove me wrong, Blazer Razor, send me one. The gauntlet is thrown down. Moving the most magical place on earth. Moving just very briefly away from the specific Kickstarter platform, we often hear heartwarming stories of struggling families in the States who have managed to raise the money for crucial medical bills via other crowdfunding platforms such as GoFundMe. Now this is something I can get behind. In a recent Business Plays video, we mentioned how the father of Success Kid was in of the Success Kid meme was in need of an urgent kidney transplant and was able to raise $75,000 on GoFundMe, largely thanks to internet fame of his fiercely triumphant, sand-crushing toddler son. So it's a bit disappointing to hear that the official advice is to still steer well clear of this sort of thing. And with good reason. Really? Why? Oh, I mean, as a donor? Yeah, I mean, I'm not giving money to some random person. If I know, like, not because I'm a dickhead, but because there's so many scams. But if it's like, you know, a friend of a friend, then I will. In 2014, 37-year-old compassionate and caring special education teacher from Alabama called Jennifer Flynn Cataldo announced to her friends that she had, and family that she had terminal cancer. Oh god, if she doesn't have terminal cancer, this is terrible. I don't think we need to try and drag out the suspenser as I'm pretty sure we know where this one is heading. Jennifer didn't have cancer at all. Jennifer, you are a... Piece of sh uh, but that didn't stop her from launching a campaign on GoFundMe under the banner My Mum Has Terminal Cancer Disney Trip, with the idea being that she wanted to take her young son to Disney World for one last magical adventure before she passed away. Even her own son believed that her mum his mum had only one year to live. Oh. <laughs> 
I would like to see you go to prison. Uh, she deserves it. She desperately deserves it. In total, Jennifer received over $38,000 in pledges from the two campaigns, and she also managed to drum up another $160,000 in generous donations from family members and friends before some of them started to get a bit suspicious. Uh, at least she's ruined her life. Jennifer eventually pled guilty to one count of wire fraud and one count of bank fraud, although 13 additional federal fraud charges were surprisingly dismissed. Don't dis- oh, I spilt my water. You're getting too old for this shit. Don't dismiss that. What are you doing? The Enron guy went to prison. Bernie Madoff went to prison. Jennifer, or whatever her name is, Flynn, should be up there as well. She was sentenced to 25 months in prison in order to pay $81,000 in restitution, while GoFundMe returned all of the money to pledges. Okay, great. That's, I mean, 25 months in prison, I have to say. Normally, when I read these, and it's like, and then he, he stole like a million dollars, and then he went to prison for 45 years, and I'm like, I mean, he deserved prison. <laughs> it does seem a bit harsh. I don't like 25 months. Not enough on this one. It may seem hard to comprehend how anyone could have managed to convince her closest friends, family members, that her young son, and her young son, that she was terminally ill. Why, why do you think that's hard? If I just wanted to lie to my family that I had cancer, I'd lie to my family that I had cancer. I don't, I don't do it not because it's impossible. I don't do it because I'm not a horrific piece of shit, allegedly. Apparently, Jennifer was a previously upstanding citizen who fell to pieces when her brother died and she became addicted to prescription painkillers. A big wad of the money she accrued from fraudulent campaigns funded this expensive habit. Oh, brilliant, Danny. Thanks for not using that at the start. Now I sound like a right dickhead. As far as we can make out, the trip to Disney World never happened, so Mickey Mouse got ripped off as well. Uh, the meme restaurant. To lighten the mood a little, it's about time. Because this video in the last, last video, I made a whole business place about death. I'm editing and I'm like, oh god, this isn't funny at all. My like stand-up comedy people were right. To lighten the mood a little, here's an idea that looks ideal for our resident memeologist, Sam. Ooh, it's exciting! After a hard day's memeing, I bet there's literally nothing else in the world that Sam would rather do than pop into the meme restaurant for a bite to eat, where everything on the menu is themed around a famous internet meme. Yeah, Danny, because everyone immediately after work likes going home and doing their work. <laughs> It's like, as soon as I get home, I just read the business news to my wife, and she loves it. <laughs> never happen, never will. Sadly for Sam, he may have to wait a while longer for his dream to materialize, as the Kickstarter campaign never really took off. No! God, please, no! 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 The concept was cooked up by 25-year-old Catriona Crehan and her teenage brother Sean, who hoped to raise $300,000 to open their own meme restaurant in California. The planned menu would include such meme-tastic munchies as Lord of the Onion Rings. Uh, one does not simply order one. I, I, I don't get the, the joke there because I've never seen Lord of the Rings and never will. Uh, the Haram Burger, a burger intended to invoke the spirit of Harambe. The Kafifi Burger, a coffee dedicated to Trump's unique vocabulary. And my own favorite, the Rick Roll. A uh, red velvet cheesecake that's never going to desert you. Very clever. Very clever indeed. Are these the jokes that they came up for? It, I feel like uh, if these aren't Danny's own, if these were actually the things from the Kickstarter page, wow, you should have done a better job, because I thought Danny made these up in about four seconds. But it has to be said that the Kickstarter campaign seemed a little undercooked at best. In the FAQ section, the question, what experience do you have with restaurants, is answered with a cheerful, us personally? None. But who says we can't learn? I don't know. That's pretty reasonable. I mean, I don't think most people who start restaurants have experienced starting restaurants. Although, to be fair, they're probably just wasting their own money and the bank's money rather than be like, hey, random internet strangers, pay for my restaurant. But the biggest problem seemed to be with this. Also, can't you can't just name shit like Lord of the Onion Rings. Peter Jackson or whoever the... Which, did he do Lord of the Rings or is it the other dude, James Cameron? It doesn't f matter. I get them confused all the time. I don't like any of their movies. Um, wait, who did Terminator? I like Terminator. He's going to sue the f out of you. You'd be like, yeah, Lord of the Onion Rings. Uh, well, here's a cease and desist, and we're seeking damages. It's why I can't just name this channel Business Blaze by Theranos now. I have to acquire the trademark first. But the biggest problem seemed to be with the structure of the pledge tiers. A Kickstarter campaign usually includes a low-rung pledge option of about a dollar, which gets you a thank you or a key ring or something equally crap, and then you gradually move up to the bigger perks. The cheapest pledge tier for the meme restaurant is a staggering $5,000, which got you a special certificate signed by the creator, and 20 free visits to the restaurant. The biggest tier of $10,000 threw in an invite to the the opening day, and you got a dish on the menu named after you. But the world 
wasn't quite ready for Whistler's walnut balls. Yeah, definitely not. I'm not spending ten fucking thousand dollars on something like that. <laughs> you smoking crack? The campaign was ripped to shreds on social media and only managed to attract a grand total of six dollars and sixty-six cents before the creators pulled it from the platform within seventy-two hours, out of sheer embarrassment. Even the backers were very vocal in the criticism. What? Well, one of them. <laughs> the first backer posted on the campaign page, "This is a terrible idea," while another backer revealed that I only pledged to see how badly this product will eventually fail. Catriona later claimed that the whole thing was just meant to be satirical, but I'm not buying it. Oh my god, this is the biggest thing ever. Like, someone will leave a YouTube comment, and I, I'll absolutely burn the shit out of them. And then they'll be like, oh, Simon, you took the bait, it was just a joke. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're hilarious. I bet it was. You cockwomble. She posted, as a social experiment, we created a horrid Kickstarter as the ultimate trolling. I'd like to thank my mum, my dad, and all the saddos who made this possible. Thanks for the laughs, guys. Oh, you just got burned too bad and you can't take the heat, Carolina. Catriona, no one cares. This seems a bit out of sync with her comments a few days earlier when she claimed she was just trying to help her realize her autistic brother's dreams. Yeah, it's a joke at his expense. <laughs> and she felt personally threatened by the aggressive feedback. I still reckon something like this will pop up one day, just maybe not on Kickstarter. So we may get to see Grumpy Gat, Guacamole, and Bed Intruder Burritos. Yeah, we won't, because they'll sue the <laughs> out of you. Is it me? you're looking for. Ah, uh, this is the next item on the list. I know we usually like to focus on dramatic failures, but I just wanted to give a very quick mention to a Kickstarter project that quite incredibly got funded. Dude, I mean, there's so much that gets funded on Kickstarter. Don't be surprised. I'd like to think that most of us have seen the cringeworthy cheese fest that is the 1984 Lionel Richie music video for Hello. Danny, I have not. It's one no one is surprised by this. It's one uh, where Lionel Richie plays the part of an acting teacher who appears to fall in love with a blind student. He spends most of the video mooching and singing, Hello, is it me you're looking for? Oh God, that's not appropriate. Until the thrilling climax where the blind student reveals that she's made a surprisingly accurate clay sculpture of Lionel's big head. What the f is going on? Nearly 30 years later, this proved to be the inspiration for a Barcelona-based art collective called Hungry Castle, all right, who, decided they wanted to make a giant three meter tall inflatable model of Lionel Richie's head to show off at the Best of All Music Festival on the Isle of Wight in 2013. What's going on? They were originally hoping to raise £4,900 for this frankly bizarre art installation, but ended up receiving over £8,000 in pledges and achieved their dream of getting Lionel's big head to face the audience of the festival with pride. What is going on? This is just absurd. If it wasn't, if that wasn't quite strange enough, Lionel's head was billed as a fully immersive experience. Festival goers could actually walk inside the back of the inflated head one at a time. Once inside, you'd find nothing more than a big telephone, which would start ringing upon your arrival. I f***ing hate art sometimes. You can never say like, I hate art. Like I hate all art, because there is some art that is fantastic, but also this is not art. Forget the clown sex book that I was talking about before. Uh, sexual predator book, you know, it's got to have a good hook. I once, I was, I was once browsing Amazon and I somehow stumbled across a book called Taken by the T-Rex. And yes, it's exactly what you're thinking. After you'd instinctively picked up the telephone, you'd be greeted with Lionel's voice on the other end singing, hello, is it me you're looking for? I bet that never got old. Suddenly the laser razor doesn't seem like such a silly idea after all. They all sound like silly ideas. Internet browsing history for sale. Oh my God. My new kick Kickstarter. Forget the clowns. Forget my experimental art installation. I'll kickstart my internet browsing history. It's really weird. I'm not sure anyone would be particularly interested in scrolling through my internet history. Just taking a quick look now, the first things that pop up on my screen are elevator designer jobs, cheap cutting tools. How many cents does it cost to produce a decal sticker? Does Kickstarter have anything to do with communism? I love those last two. It's because I have stickers on my merch store and they're so outrageously expensive. But it's like, I think they're like $7 or something. Don't buy them, don't buy them. You can go to uh, perchthemerch.co to buy the reasonably priced merch like t-shirts, which I feel like 20 something bucks, that seems quite reasonable. But like, you can buy like a single sticker for like $7. And I think they cost like, I get $2 out of that. And I was just like, I could make them like cost nothing, but they'd still be like five bucks or something insane. And I was just like, I don't know, just don't, don't buy them. I mean, if you really want to, if you're like absolutely balling rich, I mean, I, I really think like having a Simon Whistler sticker on your laptop is more, ex is like more of a flex than having like, I don't know, some turbo Mac mega computer or, Whatever. Uh, back in 2017, a bloke called Adam Mc... 
Elony put forward an intriguing proposal to the crowdfunding community. He wanted to launch a website called Search Internet History, in which he could search the browsing history of specific U.S. congressmen, executives, and their families. Dude, that doesn't sound legal. First, a bit of context. This was actually a retaliatory strike against 264 Republican members of Congress who voted to reverse an incoming new Obama-led rule which would have required internet service providers to seek your explicit permission before selling your data to third parties. Trump later signed off on the legislation to reverse the rule, which meant that ISPs could happily continue selling off data to the highest bidders. I was creeped the f out the other day, so I was looking for, uh, like a business tool, like, um, what's it called? Like one of those, uh, like accountancy software that plugs into your bank and can take the information like okay so here's an incoming payment and it automatically labels it that kind of you know and a friend a friend of mine sent me i asked my friend of mine like what do you use and he was like i use this this app and i'm like great so i visit the website i take a look and i'm like okay this will do what i want and i leave the website and uh on my mobile phone and I don't return to it. I just make a note that I will look it up later. And then, you know every week, like if you're on LinkedIn, LinkedIn will send you a message and it'll say like, people from these companies searched for you this week. And there, right there, is like, someone from that company searched for me. And I'm like, what the f is going on? And it's not a big company, and it was the next day. So it's not a coincidence, and it's creepy. Adam McElhinney wasn't very happy about any of this. He noted how one of the members of Congress, Marsha Blackburn, had received $84,000 in donations from telecommunications companies in 2016 cycle alone, and had felt that Congress had sold out an American citizen's privacy in return for cold, hard cash. Okay, yeah, I guess. This shouldn't be legal. Why is this legal? Why are we even having this discussion? It obviously should be private. So he hatched a plan to turn the tables. The website Search Internet History would outbid every other company for data relating to specifically to specifically to Congress. That's amazing. And then post it online for everyone to see. Who's laughing now, Martha? In his pitch, Adam promised to make available the browsing history of all congressmen who voted to reverse the bill so that his website users could have a good nosy at their medical history, pornographic habits, financial records, records, indiscretions, and business plays views. This can't be right. That data must be anonymized, surely. So, okay, yes, it's going to be like one of the members of Congress. So there's like 10 of them. You're not going to know specifically who it is because like Bob from Ohio or whatever, he'll be like, no, 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 it definitely wasn't me. It was, it was Stefan who was looking up the, the, the depraved clown porn. And it seemed to be quite a popular idea. The campaign managed to quickly raise over $190,000 from more than 10,000 backers. But there was a problem. Well, there were two problems. The first problem was that Adam's plan would almost certainly have declared, been declared illegal and would have been shut down before it even got started. Yeah, Adam, you're going to open yourself up to a world of legal pain. But perhaps even more importantly, the plan was also deemed impossible because that's not really how it works. It sounds as if Adam thought he could just hand over a big bag of money to the ISPs in exchange for data relating to specific congressmen, or at least he thought he could buy lots of data in bulk and then dig through it all to find the bits he wanted. But it's way more complicated than that, and most advertisers are only interested in buying the viewing history of potential faceless customers rather than any actual personal details. For example, a company flogging cigarette umbrellas <laughs> OG business blaze legend joke right there would be interested in gathering, uh, interested in targeting their ads at potential customer who had been browsing material related to their products. <laughs> or people who smoke cigarettes in the UK, uh, but they didn't want his name, his job title, or his shoe size because that information would be completely useless to them, of course. And so that personal information is not really what the ISPs are selling in the first place because there's no market for it. Yeah, I'm totally okay. Look, that's anonymized, impersonal data. I don't care about that. Like, all the people who are like, oh, you know, I use the VPN because I don't want the advertising retargeting me. I'm like, honestly, the advertising is much better now. Before it was like, I'd get all sorts of advertising that wasn't relevant to me. And now it's like, I just get advertising that's highly targeted to me. And I'm like, great, that's probably something I'm going to buy. It's better. Why wouldn't we like this? Yeah, it's a little creepy. It's more creepy when someone looks you the f up on LinkedIn. But more importantly, how do they know who I am? And then do they look me up on LinkedIn? You f***ing weirdos. If that's you, if that's you out there and you saw me visiting your website and then you Googled me and you somehow came across this. Creepy, dude. Creepy. And so that personal information is not really what the ISPs are selling in the first place because there's no market for it. It also has to be said that crowd hunting campaign built on the bricks of cold revenge is never destined for success, particularly when the funding page happily declared that the proposed website would be targeting the families of congressmen, which leaves more than a nasty taste in the mouth. When it was eventually pointed out to Adam that his idea couldn't possibly work either legally or technically, the campaign was dropped and the money returned to backers. Adam later cryptically declared, when I mentioned I want 
wanted to obtain the web habits and history of the legislators and their families who approved the bill, I meant that in an abstract sense. Ah, uh, look, look, dude, what was your name? Whatever the fuck, Adam. Just say allegedly. Just, just, that's the catch-all phrase, man. Learn from the blaze. Just be like, no, 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 I didn't want to do that. Allegedly. Alle this allegedly has been business blaze i have been your boy with the blaze simon if you like this video smash that like button if you didn't i'd invite you to smash the dislike button but you watched all the way to the end so uh why don't you go over to perchthemerch.co and buy some merch smash the dislike button there's also new designs being uploaded all the time i've got some being shipped from teespring right now so hopefully i'll be wearing them soon i'm excited thank you for watching I don't do it because I'm not a horrific piece of shit.